Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number four of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. This lesson is titled Parables and is ready for teaching on July 27. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, We thank you for these amazing messages that come to us from the book of Mark. We thank you for what he has written, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit who has inspired him. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be there to guide us and bless us as we turn the pages of your word. May those words stand out. May they imprint on our minds and our hearts. And may we be able to share them with those around us, we pray. And today I'd like to pray for Sophia Forrester and her debilitating illness and for Veta and her youth class and other ministries she's involved in and especially for Mrs Skinner and Ella and for Libby Adventist Church in Montana and for Charmaine Scott and her needs, including her children and grandchildren. Lord, bless them. And we pray for Rose Lynn Joseph and her family in the United States, and Lily Glory and her siblings. Lord, each of these people has asked for help, and we pray that you will be with them, bless them, strengthen them, guide them in their walk with you, and may their requests meet the help that you can give them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 4 and verses 24 and 25. Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. So Frank, will you read that again for us? I am Frank from Harvey Bay, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. This week's study is on the parables of Mark chapter 4. The Gospel of Mark has the fewest parables of any of the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark and Luke. For many years, scholars have argued over the meaning and interpretation of Jesus' parables, how to interpret what they mean, why Jesus used them, what kind of lessons they were intended to reveal, and how literally they were to be taken, or whether they were purely allegory and so forth. Obviously, we are not going to solve all these issues in this week's lesson. Instead, we are going to look at them and, by God's grace, come away with an understanding of the points Jesus made through these parables. Mark 4 has just five parables. The sower, the lamp, the measure, the growing seed and the mustard seed. The majority of the chapter revolves around the parable of the sower. This parable is told first, followed by the reason for parables, and then the interpretation of a parable. This three-step pattern will be the focus of the studies for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Then the other parables will be the subject of study on Wednesday and Thursday. Sunday, July 21 the parable of the sower. Read Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. What are the different soils like, and what happens to the seed that falls on them? Mark 4, beginning at verse 1. Again Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, 
a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When reading the parables of Jesus in the Gospel, people often want to jump quickly to the interpretation. After all, is that not the point of these stories? To teach some spiritual truth for Christian life? Yes, but sometimes, other than in brief comments such as the kingdom of God is like, or he who has ears to hear, let him hear, Jesus does not explain the parable. Consequently, it is good to slow down and simply analyse the story itself in order to catch the direction its various narrative characteristics point toward. Doing this with the parable of the sower yields a variety of ideas. The seed is the same in each case, but falls in four different types of soil. The type of soil greatly influences the outcome for the seed. Instead of one continuous story, the parable is actually four individual stories told to completion in each setting. The length of time for completing the story lengthens with each successive story. The seed that falls on the road is eaten immediately by the birds. And it happened, as he sowed, that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Verse 4. The seed that falls on the rocky ground takes a few days or weeks to reach its failed outcome, which included being scorched by the sun. The seed that falls on the weedy soil takes longer still to reach its unproductive end, choked as it is by the thorns. The seed that falls on the good soil takes the longest of all presumably an entire growing season, as is the normal pattern for a crop. Three of the stories are about failure. Only the last is about success, a good, abundant crop. The length of the stories, the longer and longer period of time for each successive story, and the fact that only one story is about success, all point to the risk of failure, but the abundant outcome of success. The parable seems to point to the cost of discipleship and the risks involved, but it also highlights the abundant reward of following Jesus. And so to finish today, what are some other spiritual lessons that we can learn from nature? Monday, July 22 Jesus' Interpretation Jesus was done with the parable and gave no immediate explanation. According to the text in Mark 4 verse 1, Jesus spoke it before a great multitude. Mark 4 verse 1 reads, Again Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore, at the water's edge. Only later, with a smaller group, as we read in Mark 4.10, did he explain what the parable meant. And that reads, When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. Read Mark chapter 4, verses 13 to 20. How did Jesus interpret the parable of the sower? Mark 4, beginning at verse 13, Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, 
hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. Jesus interprets the parable by identifying the items external to the story that a number of the details in the story stand for. The interpretation indicates that the story is a loose allegory with references to the real world, not necessarily a reference for every single detail. Jesus identifies the seed as the Word. This would refer to the Word of God, particularly as preached by Jesus. James 1.21 states, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. The different soils are different types of listeners. In Jesus' interpretation, Everyone hears the word. That is, all the types of soil have seeds sown on them, but the reception is different. Path soil is hard, and the birds snatch away the seed. Jesus links this to Satan's taking away the truth. Rocky soil has little depth. Jesus links this to people with shallow commitments. They have not counted the cost of discipleship. Weedy soil chokes the seed sown on it. Jesus explains that this stands for the cares of life and riches that choke out the word. But the good soil stands for those who hear the word and receive it so that it grows and produces an abundant crop. The longest explanations are for the rocky ground and the weedy ground. In describing the rocky ground, hearers, Jesus points to contrasting elements. They receive the word with joy, but are temporary disciples. When persecution comes, they fail away. The weedy ground hearers are a contrast. They do not fall away because of hard times, but because of good times. Their focus is on the things of the world instead of the kingdom of God. Their cares and concerns revolve around what the world has to offer. And so to finish today, consider your own life. Are any characteristics of the path, the rocky ground or weedy ground creeping into your experience? This could happen more subtly than you realise. What choice can you make to change if need be? Tuesday, July 23, The Reason for the Parables Read Mark chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. Why did Jesus teach in parables? Mark 4, beginning at verse 10, When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside... Everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. A surface reading of these verses gives the impression that Jesus taught in parables to keep outsiders in the dark, but such a perspective does not fit with Jesus' actions elsewhere in Mark. In Mark chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Jesus is grieved by the hard hearts of the religious leaders. Mark 3, beginning at verse 5, he looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. 
In Mark 3, 22 to 30, Jesus takes the arguments of the scribes seriously and explains in detail why they are mistaken. So we look at Mark chapter 3 and beginning at verse 22 through to verse 30. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, People can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. In Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12, the religious leaders understand that Jesus' parable of the tenants is about them. Just listen to this in Mark 12, beginning at verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. It is actually a warning of where their plot against him is heading and the terrible consequences to follow. If he had no concerns for them, he would not warn them. Consequently, Jesus' words here in Mark 4 need a closer look in order to recognize what his point is. Jesus is paraphrasing Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And that reads, He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding, Be ever seeing, but never perceiving, Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn to be healed. Read Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. What happens to Isaiah here, and what is the message he is given to take to Israel? Isaiah 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim. Each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding, Be ever seeing, but never perceiving, Make the heart of this people calloused, Make their ears dull and close their eyes, Otherwise they might see with their eyes, Hear with their ears, Understand with their hearts, And turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent every one far away and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land." Isaiah sees a vision of God in the temple and is overwhelmed by God's glory and his own uncleanness. God cleanses him and commissions him with a shocking message. Just like Mark, it sounds out of step with the rest of Isaiah where there is much comfort for God's people. In Isaiah 6, the message is meant to shock the people awake so they will turn from their evil ways. In Mark, the key for understanding Jesus' words is found in Mark 3, verse 35. To understand Jesus' words and teachings, one must do the will of God. Let's read that verse. Mark 3, verse 35. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This brings that person into the family of Jesus. Those who have already decided that Jesus is possessed by the devil will not listen. The point of Jesus' quotation from Isaiah 6 is not that God is keeping people out, but that their own preconceived ideas and hardness of heart prevent them from accepting the saving truth. This truth is the overarching concept of the parable of the sower. Each one chooses what type of soil to be. All decide for themselves whether or not they will surrender to Jesus. In the end, we each choose. Wednesday, July 24. Lamp and Measuring Basket. Read Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. What is Jesus' special emphasis in the parable of the lamp? Mark 4, beginning at verse 21, He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Houses in that part of the world in Jesus' day varied in size and construction, all depending on location and wealth. The houses came to follow a Greek pattern of being built around a courtyard, but with varying levels of sophistication. Or Jesus may be talking about smaller houses of peasants. Big house or small house, the issue is this principle. One day, the truth about Jesus will be revealed. Jesus asked two questions in Mark 4.21. The first one expects a negative answer. The lamp is not brought to be placed under the basket or under the bed, is it? 
The second question expects a positive answer. It is brought to be placed on the lampstand, isn't it? Jesus presents an absurd, almost humorous scenario to make his point. Lamps are for giving light, or they lose their purpose. Mark 4.22 explains the parable by referencing the idea of secrets being made public. Anyone whose email or computer has been hacked understands the possibility of secrets being made public. But what Jesus is talking about is the gospel. Read Mark 4, 24 and 25. What lesson is Jesus conveying with the parable of the measuring basket? Mark 4, beginning at verse 24. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. In most locations in the world, fresh produce is sold in open markets. Sellers typically have a device for measuring the product they are selling. It is a common practice of such sellers to add just a little bit more to a scale to help the buyer feel he or she is being treated fairly. Jesus picks up on how good sellers treat buyers to make a point about openness to the truth. If one is open and follows the light, he or she will get even more. But if he or she rejects the light, even what they had before will be taken away. And so to finish today, how can we better understand the principle that with what measure you use, it will be measured to you? Think about it in all your dealings with others. Thursday, July 25, Parables of Growing Seed Read Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. What is the primary focus of this parable? Mark 4, beginning at verse 26. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Most of the Gospel of Mark has parallels in either Matthew or Luke or both. But this is not the case with this parable. It is unique to Mark. The focus of this brief parable is the growing process. Jesus indicates that this is how the kingdom of God works. Humans have a part to play, but the real growth is the work of God. It is not an endless process. The story comes to an abrupt end with the maturation of the grain. Just so, the return of Christ a second time will suddenly bring an end to our world's history. Read Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 30 through to 32. What is the important stress of the parable of the mustard seed? And that reads Mark 4, beginning at verse 30. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. This parable stresses how something very tiny grows into something remarkably large. Mustard seeds measure typically 1 to 2 millimetres in diameter. That's 0 0.039 to 0 0.079 inches. Very small. The plant described here is probably the black mustard or brassica nigra, which has tiny seeds, more than 700 seeds in one gram. While not the smallest seeds in the world, they are quite small, especially in comparison to the plant they produce, which can grow as large as 3 metres or 10 feet tall. Jesus notes that birds even nest in the branches of the mustard plant. 
This last reference is an allusion to Psalm 104 verse 2 with an allusion to Daniel 4 verses 10 to 12 as well. Let's have a look at Psalm 104 verse 12. The birds of the sky nest by the waters, they sing among the branches. And Daniel chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. Psalm 104 speaks of God's power in creating the world, and Daniel 4 represents Nebuchadnezzar as a great tree under which all the world finds shade and food. The point Jesus makes is that the kingdom of God, which began very small, will become large and impressive. People in Jesus' day may have looked down on the dusty itinerant preacher from Galilee with his band of disciples, but time has shown that his kingdom of grace continues to expand throughout the world. And so to finish today, Matthew 24 verse 14 reads, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Consider what the church was like when Jesus made that prediction. Why is this such a remarkable and faith-affirming prediction? Friday, July 26. Further Thought True holiness, Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lessons, pages 48 and 49, is wholeness in the service of God. This is the condition of true Christian living. Christ asked for an unreserved consecration for undivided service. He demands the heart, the mind, the soul, the strength. Self is not to be cherished. He who lives to himself is not a Christian. Love must be the principle of action. Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth, and it must be the foundation of the Christian's character. This alone can make and keep him steadfast. This alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation. And love will be revealed in sacrifice. The plan of redemption was laid in sacrifice, a sacrifice so broad and deep and high that it is immeasurable. Christ gave all for us, and those who receive Christ will be ready to sacrifice all for the sake of their Redeemer. The thought of his honour and glory will come before anything else. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Love must be the principle of action. Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth. How does the cross reveal this amazing truth to us? In our lives, how can we reflect this kind of love? Why must we? And question two, how would you respond to someone who insisted that Jesus told parables to keep outsiders in the dark? Why would Jesus, who died for every human being, deliberately keep in the dark people whom he had died on the cross to save, as we see in 1 John 2 and verse 2? He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And question 4. A lamp is supposed to be on a lampstand, not under a basket. As you read in Matthew 4.21, he said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? Apply this principle to your church's engagement with your local community. How can you lift the light up higher? And four... Consider the parable of the growing seed of Mark 4, 26-28. What part do humans play in helping the seed, the gospel seed, to grow, and what part does God play? Though we obviously play a role, how can we still make sure we are totally dependent upon God? 
Could this attitude of total dependence perhaps be part of what we need to do in order to grow? And Mark chapter 4 verses 26 to 29 reads, He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Sparks Over the Sabbath by Andrew McChesney Father wasn't worried when Mother got baptised after attending Seventh-day Adventist meetings at their town schoolhouse in Armenia. Father wasn't worried when his daughter Anush and her sister started going to Adventist summer camps. He even drove them to camp. Father also wasn't worried when Anush, as a 17-year-old university student, decided to get baptised and join the Adventist church. But he was furious when the university called to complain that Anush was skipping classes on Sabbath. Students missed classes for various reasons, and the university didn't mind that Anush wanted to keep the Sabbath. The problem was that other students kept their reasons to themselves. But Anush unabashedly announced her absence as a matter of religious liberty. If she doesn't want to go to class, then she doesn't have to go to class, a university administrator told her father. But why does she have to make a big deal about it? She is hurting the university's reputation. Father was appalled. He felt like his daughter's faith was reflecting badly on the family. He reprimanded her when she came home. <coughs> why did you have to announce that at the university, he asked. If this is the way that things are going to be, I forbid you from going to that church. He also prohibited her from getting baptised. I'm responsible for protecting you, he said. When you are older, you can make your own decisions. But for now, I'm your guardian. Anush didn't argue. Armenia is a largely patriarchal society where a father's word is law. But she wondered when the line was between the fourth and the fifth commandments. Could she go to church and honour father at the same time? She had decided before God to get baptised, but she worried that father might forbid mother from going to church if she insisted. Mother suggested that Anush wait. She found support for a delay in Numbers 30, 3 to 5 which says if a daughter makes a vow while living in her father's house and her father approves then God accepts it but if the daughter makes a vow that the father overrules then God releases the daughter from the vow I think God supports the decision to wait to get baptized mother said Anush waited it was a difficult four years at the university she believed that father was a good man who only wanted the best for her but she also longed to go to church and get baptised. She found joy in the baptism of a classmate, a woman who had learned about the Sabbath when she refused to study on that day. The classmate became Anusha's first soul for Christ. Part of last quarter's 13th Sabbath offering went to open a centre of influence for families like Anusha's in Yerevan, Armenia. Thank you for helping spread the gospel with your offerings. Next week, Father changes his mind about Anusha's baptism.